Shalom from here in the Holy Land. Welcome to Conversations with Yael Podcast. I'm your host, Yael Eckstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Each month, I will invite leading thought leaders, pastors, rabbis, and other influential guests to discuss the importance of Israel in the world today. For those familiar with my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, which explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, this podcast takes that understanding and translates it into ongoing support for Israel among Christians and the critical need to nurture that support with the next generation of Christians. Join me now as we begin this important dialogue. March is a time to celebrate women. It's Women's History Month. March 8th is International Women's Day. And on March 12th, we celebrate National Working Moms Day, which is why I can't think of a better person to have on the podcast today than my next guest, Paula Ferris. Woohoo! As many of you know, Paula is the Emmy Award winning broadcast journalist who spent nine years at ABC News, where she co anchored Good Morning America Weekend, co hosted The View, and launched Journeys of Faith with Paula Ferris. Then in 2018, at the height of her career, Paula pumped the brakes, totally burned out and feeling like she was failing both at work and at home. She authored her first book called out why I traded two dream jobs for a life of a true calling. After she lost her job at ABC News in 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, Paula began a new chapter in her life, a mission to support and give voice to the 35 million women in the workforce. Through her organization called Carrie Media, Paula now devotes her many talents as a journalist and an author to amplify the story of working moms, to cheer them on, and to advocate for change for women in the workplace. As a working mom myself, balancing the needs of my four children and husband with running the largest nonprofit humanitarian organization in Israel, I know that I have felt all the same emotions as every working mom. Stress, exhaustion, burnout. It's comforting to know that we are not alone and that we have such a passionate advocate in Paula. So, Paula, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yael. It's so great to officially meet you. Oh my gosh. I feel like we are sisters already, even though we haven't <laughs> technically met, but everything that I've read about you mm. and everything that I've been following your career, it's all just so relatable. Um, and Thank so, you. yeah, you've created really this joint bond and sisterhood amongst all women, whether they're working, staying at home, juggling a little bit of all of it. You've given that voice that's so needed in the world to give Thank legitimacy you. to what women are going Thank through. You. Well, it- it's something I'm very passionate about uh, in this season, and I feel really called to champion mothers and mothers in the workplace in this season. So it's my honor, and I also feel like it's my responsibility to do so. Wow, so beautiful. And everything that you've ever done, you've done with full passion, which is why I think you've been successful in everything that you've (laughs) tried out and dabbled in throughout your career. You just have taken off and become a star because you're so passionate. So now you're focusing on Carrie Media, which is uh, the newest venture that you launched one year ago in 2022. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey of how you got there and why you felt at this point of your life that was your calling? Well, let me back it up. And you mentioned the passion. I think I get that from my situ, which is my Lebanese grandmother. Uh, Lebanese women are very fiery. So I think I, I owe it. all my passion to my situ. Thank Mary you, Ferris, situ. Tilhub. Oh, yes. Thank you, situ. But I look, I, I think we're called to different things in different seasons, Yael. Yeah. You know, and I was in broadcasting for over 20 years. And I was, was faced with this decision um, in 2020. Uh, do I continue in television news? Because as you mentioned, I lost my job right at the beginning of the pandemic. The ABC chose not to re-sign me. And so I had two decisions in that moment. Could Should I take the safe route and take another job in television news, which was expected, right? That was the safe yeah. choice that I'd worked in television news for over 20 years. Or do I go for this thing that's been like burning in my spirit for a really long time and that is to advocate for mothers in the workplace i'm a mother of three i've always worked and i've always felt that tension um being a working mom 
and just being a mom in general, not feeling valued, um, motherhood is scrutinized and punished instead of celebrated. Often in America, we have to choose between working and momming. Uh, we carry tremendous amounts of mom guilt and, and we're burnt out in just this never ending tension of feeling also like we're never quite nailing it. And then there's gender pay disparity and a lot of inequities. And so, look, it, I, I think it started probably nine years ago after the birth of my third child and I had returned to work at Good Morning America. And I got, it was my first day back, Yael, from maternity leave. And I got an email from an executive and the email said, not your best look. Now oh. this, is my, this was my first day back from maternity leave. And of course I'm not feeling so great. And I read that email and I responded to it. And I said, you know, I just, my, it's my first day back from maternity leave. I'm already not feeling so great about myself. If you could give me a little grace, that would be appreciated. And Good it was really you. in that, it was in that moment. I was hurt at first. And then I got really angry um, because why is motherhood not celebrated? I just furthered society and yet I'm being held to this unrealistic, unsustainable standard. Mm -hmm. So that kind of like that, that it was that moment that really lit the fire. And then just my experience culminated with the experience of so many other mothers in the workplace. Um, I've heard hundreds of stories. It just set me on this journey to, to change the game for working moms. Um, Carrie, we believe being a working mom should work and we really want to give working moms the support that they need and deserve. So that's my mission in this season. Wow. That is so incredible. So relatable. I think no matter what profession you're in, whether you're a checkout clerk at the supermarket or you're a teacher or a social worker or on Good Morning America, um, <laughs> I think that's so relatable going back to work after you give birth and just feeling like you're not doing good enough. And someone right. makes a comment that completely throws you off and it makes you check in with yourself. Am I going totally. to accept this? Am I going to respond like you did standing up for yourself, empowering yourself and saying, give me, give me a little bit of grace. I just <laughs> right. birthed a human being into this world. Right. Um, or are you going to be down on yourself and beat yourself up, which so many women do? Absolutely. There's not a lot of support um, for motherhood in the United States, and it's really not celebrated. We're not valued and we're, we're, we're scrutinized and we're paid less and we're scrutinized more. And we mm -hmm. just, I just want to change that because I think, look, I don't think you have to have a child in order to fulfill your calling as a woman, but I think it is one of the highest callings that a woman is called to is motherhood. And if we don't have children, we don't have a society. That's just the reality of it. So, yeah. um, celebrate us. Don't punish us for, right. for, for doing something that's actually furthering and benefiting society. Amen, so. sister. Amen. <laughs> Don't get me going, Yael. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get you going. We want to hear it. <laughs> so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I, I think I could uh, probably put mm -hmm. my own um, uh, narrative to this, but what was for you behind mm -hmm. the name Carrie Media? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Look, it, going back to that moment where I'm like, I've got these two divergent paths. Do I continue in TV news or do I go for this thing? I don't, I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I'm not a founder. I don't know anything about starting a company, but I love to champion people and I like to ask questions and I'm inherently curious and I get the job done and I'm really proactive and that made me a good broadcaster. So I just, I had to press into my fear and go for this and empty my retirement savings. Like I'm all in. Um, but it, it once I decided to to go for this, we were I was I remember just sitting in the living room uh, uh, of my home. I, I didn't hire a big marketing firm or a branding firm to come up with a name. It literally just came to me. You birthed I it. it. Yeah, I, I I birthed it. Yes, it was the easiest birth that I've had, the, the the most painless birth, I should say. <laughs> but it was just kind of a placeholder. I'm like, I have to call it something. And I and I thought carry we carry babies, but also we want to carry women through mm -hmm. this important time in their life and through these touch points of their lives. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and also the Bible talks about carrying one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. Now, Carry is not a faith-based organization. We are not politically affiliated or motivated. I, we are united in the fact that, um, you know, giving mothers uh, the support that they need. And that's something I think we can all agree on, regardless yeah. of our faith background or our political affiliations, but carry, we want to carry the burdens of mothers and we want to carry them through these moments in life. And again, it was just like a placeholder. Oh, we'll think of another name. And then it just kind of stuck. And we're like, it's a great, so 
Gary, there we go. My big branding firm came up with it. <laughs> You're hired. Brilliant. <laughs> Oh. It's, I love everything that you just mm -hmm. said, because I, I live in Israel, of course, mm -hmm. where um, uh, you, maybe you could say we are the conflict center of the world. Mm -hmm. And many people don't know this, but Israel has a tiny population of only 9 million citizens and 20% of those are minorities, are non-Jews, are Arabs, are Bedouins, or Druze mm -hmm. who have um, equal rights and are represented in the government of Israel the same way, equal voting rights, equal education, etc. And on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, though, you don't necessarily have so much to do with one another. And always when you don't see one another, that's what creates the conflict and the animosity. And the time that I felt most connected to my people, meaning all the people of Israel, the mm -hmm. Israeli Arabs and the Israeli Druze and the Israeli Bedouins and the Israeli Christians was when I gave birth. And I was in the birthing mm. unit with everyone, mothers. Yes. And mm. when I was walking around pushing the stroller in the park and there's a Arabic woman pushing her baby who comes and asks me, do you have an extra diaper? I ran out of diapers yes. and I need one for my baby. And of course, suddenly yes. you're just human. You're just mm -hmm. mothers. You just want the best for your children. So Absolutely. the fact that uh, Carrie Media, just like the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, is non-political and is here mm -hmm. to really serve a mission that's bigger than any one religion, one group of people is something that's so powerful because if motherhood doesn't break down those barriers, I Absolutely. don't know what does. Yeah, it's it's the common denominator. And I really believe, and in, in, yes, you're in Israel, in America, and you know this well too. Um, I think so many of the issues that we face here in America are in direct response to how we value or don't value families mm. and how we treat mothers in the workplace. And I think we all need to come together and unite uh, to give working mothers and mothers the support that they need and deserve. Again, this is it's we're not politically affiliated. Um, we're trying to find that common ground. And this, yeah. I think, it, I really think it's something that we can agree on. But you're right, motherhood is like it is that common denominator, and we're yeah. united in that front. It levels the playing field. It absolutely does. We're all tired. We were all, <laughs> we're all, all exhausted. <laughs> we're all juggling. We're all a little fried and burned out. Um, yeah, but we're all in it together. And I don't think we'd have it any other way either, so. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> well, what has been, when I hear you speak, um, it, again, it's all so relatable, but let's bring it down to a little bit more personal. Could sure. you think of one of a hard situation, right? You shared with us your first day mm -hmm. back from maternity leave with your third baby um, when you were told it wasn't your best look. Um, <laughs> And could you think of any other kind of situations that you just felt worked so hard in juggling it all? Mm -hmm. And I love um, uh, Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers said, in the hardest moments and the scariest moments, always look for the helpers. And so yes, could you think of some so hard good. situations that you went through and who are the helpers in your life? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, a lot of the helpers have been um, male advocates in my mm -hmm. life. And that's why I don't think that we can really change the game for working moms, um, excluding men, emasculating men. We need them. They're part of the solution and part, <clears throat> <clears throat> they're part of the solution and part of the equation. But um, I remember specifically, you know, and you can talk about a, lo a lot of the issues that mothers are facing um, specifically in the workforce, whether it's burnout or juggle or the guilt or just you know, that conflict when you're working, you should be momming when you're momming, you should be working, you know what that's like, right? And, oh, yeah. and, and just that, that constant tension and the mental juggle and the exhaustion and, and just never feeling like you're enough. And you add on top of that, all the inequities, you know, you take a break to stay home and be present with your children and you have a mommy gap and you, you have a hard time getting back in the workforce or the gender pay yeah. disparity. <clears throat> and one particularly, um, hurtful and um, trying time in my career was when I found out that um, there was a significant gender pay disparity. Mm -hmm. And it was hurtful in the sense that I'm doing the same job. And I found out that I was making significantly less than my um, male counterparts. And I wouldn't have known that um, without I wouldn't have known that 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 wouldn't have been discussed, I wouldn't have had um, it, I could have had just anecdotal evidence, but I actually had evidence because it was the men in my life uh, next to me, my co-anchors and my agent, who was a male, who brought this up to me and really advocated for me and advocated that I should say something 
um, about it. So look, the, the gender pay disparity is real. I know it doesn't affect every woman, but mothers, it affects disproportionately. We make 70 cents on the dollar compared to fathers. Once we have children, we're passed over on promotions. We're seen as less viable leaders, whereas fathers, when they become fathers, they're deemed um, a better leader and more viable, and then they get paid more. So it's this uh, contradiction, right? Um, and it's 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 a reality for a lot of mothers. We're we're paid less and we're scrutinized more. And that number is even less for women of color and minorities. Um, and until we level that playing field, and that's just one of the things that we're fighting for, leveling the playing field, because the reality is 70% of mothers, yeah, you know, at some point in America will be the primary breadwinner of their kids' families. And we, if we continue to pay mothers less, we will continue um, that cycle of poverty, right? And it's no wonder that so many mothers are forced out of the workforce because they're just paid less. So it only makes sense for the father to be the primary breadwinner. So until we level that playing field, I think um, we'll continue to see huge inequities. Um, we'll continue to see huge huge inequities, but that particular time in my career was, was very hurtful because <laughs> I just felt less than. I felt like I didn't have as much value. And I knew as a mother, um, being a mother inherently had equipped me with so many more capabilities than I had prior to. I was more efficient. I was a better leader, um, empathetic, compassionate. My emotional intelligence went through the roof. Like these are all things that motherhood and parenthood equips us with once we become parents. So don't treat me like a liability and a risk. I actually have just become the ideal employee, but the workplace also needs to work for me. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a particularly hurtful time. And um, it's it's a huge issue that needs to be addressed because it continues a cycle of poverty for women and children. It's a powerful thing that you're saying um, all around, both the statistics and data and, and that uh, kind of transformed into the reality of continuing the cycle of poverty. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting because in my life, I am so blessed with the most supportive and encouraging husband who mm -hmm. was a stay-at-home dad until our youngest went into kindergarten when he started right. his business a few years ago and think God is now in the workforce and also just as on the kids as I am. We That's awesome. You're a great team. We split our schedule. We're a great team. But That's for awesome. those years that he was home with the children, it was such a kind of out of ordinary experience. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't something that was always celebrated or appreciated within society. Um, and, and so that idea, I remember mm -hmm. uh, one time someone came over and said, wow, your husband helps with the laundry. That's incredible. And my husband <laughs> said, yeah. And my wife wakes up all night with the babies to nurse them and then goes to work mm -hmm. all day. And I we split things around that. here. Yeah. I love him for that. Yes. Yeah, but it's such a lonely voice so often that the more we can integrate the voice of men who recognize the contributions sure. that women have both at home and in the workforce and yeah. how we can e e bring equality to that and yeah. how I think the only way that that could happen is also the more uh, the more that we uh, accept and normalize men mm -hmm. being involved in household uh, Absolutely. responsibilities as well. I, I completely agree with you. And I, I so I have the, the book that's come out, you don't have to carry it all ditch the mom guilt and find a better way forward. And I have an entire chapter dedicated to inviting men into the conversation. And we have yeah. to remember that men are already entering this conversation feeling intimidated and less than and they're also subject to a patriarchal society that has told them your only job is to provide for your family. And if you don't do that, you're a failure. Mm -hmm. And so writing this book, I put on my research hat, I interviewed experts and some of the most preeminent thought leaders on this. And it was so interesting, Yael, to do a deep dive into our history, American yeah. history, but also comparing it to global history and how it's so different in America to be a working mother. It's much harder to be a working mother and a mother in America than in other countries because we just don't have the support from society and culture, right? It's those attitudes. <clears throat> it's those attitudes like you just said, oh, well, you know, wow, he's so involved, you know? And, and if I'm at work, it's, well, who's raising your children? Um, so it's societal, it's cultural, it's at, at a policy level. Um, 
which I think are very connected because I think the societal attitudes transform into policy. 100%. 100%. But I think just recognizing, A, inviting men into the conversation, recognizing they're facing their own patriarchal issues of, look, you don't ha- we don't want you involved in the home. We just want you to bring home a paycheck. And if you don't bring home a paycheck, you're a failure. I think one of the greatest things that men can do, um, the, one of the greatest ways they can advocate um, for their partners is to take their paternity leave. And look, I know it's paternity leave is not widely offered, um, but if companies started offering paternity leave, what that does is right out of the gate, Yael, it levels the playing field. And it says that this is a partnership. We are raising this child together. The mother doesn't become the automatic default for everything out of the gate, right? So I think that's one of the greatest, when, when men say, what can I do? The, one of the first things I'm like, take your paternity leave, take all of it. <laughs> Um, I write about this story in the book. One of my friends uh, went on maternity leave and her husband, she, she works here in America. Her husband works for a French company. And so she actually had to go back to work before he did. And um, his paternity leave was six months. And she's like, I had no idea how much that would completely change the game and how yeah. we parent because it right. right out of the gate, it was an equal distribution. It was a partnership. We are working together and you're pushing back against this, these societal norms. And the reality is that it's up to the mother to carry it all. Now she has to be in charge of the home. She has to work. She has to manage everything. She's got to take care of the kids. Like that's why we burn out because we don't have the support from society, culture, policy, right? <laughs> we, we don't have that baked in. And then we're expected here in America to carry it all. And if we ask for help, we're either weak or, or we're a failure. So I'm a big believer in inviting men into the conversation. That's a big, uh, that's a big burden to hold. I know here mm-hmm. in Israel, um, mm-hmm. it's a mandatory 14 week fully paid by the government maternity leave and paternity. Oh, leave. My. So one, 14 well, for one both? or one or the other. So okay, one of the parents, you could split it, mm-hmm. but at least one of the parents has mm-hmm. to be with the baby up until 14 weeks. And it's wow. offered the same to the woman or the man, to the mother or the father. That's, that's and awesome. if a place of employment allows the parents to go back before this 14 week period that both parents are working, it's a felony on the workplace. Are you kidding me? So they it, hold the they hold the corporations liable. That's exactly. In- that is wonderful. And what, some of the pushback that I get and that I've received in writing this book, people will say, why is it my responsibility? Why is it my responsibility to support somebody else's child? Yeah. And I get that to a certain point. But Yael, just from, a, from an economic standpoint, if we have fewer children, then we'll have fewer laborers. And if we have a labor shortage, then we have an economic crisis. So like supporting families is not just the right thing to do. It's good for the bottom line of the economy. And if we're going to say that children are our greatest natural resource, they either are or they aren't. We're either going to invest in them or we're not going to invest in them. And this attitude of not my kid, not my problem. Look, we, yeah. we have to have the, the mantra of I am my brother's keeper. Children are our greatest natural resource. They are the future of our country because they either are our greatest natural resource or they're not. We either support families or and say we're about families or we're not. And again, supporting families is good for it's good for the bottom line of companies because it is proven there's so much research and data to back it up that if you support families via policies, family friendly policies, they're very loyal to their employers. Right. And one of the greatest costs of doing business, I don't know in what it is in Israel, but one of the greatest costs of doing business in America is retention and employee turnover. And if you can lower that, Um, you've got a loyal employee who's not going to leave. All you have to do is take care of them and acknowledge that they are a parent first. And that's not a burden. That's actually an investment in our country's future. And those same policies that you set up for families are still going to help the 25-year-old single guy who has no interest in having a family. It's going to create a culture, right, that makes it really tough to leave because it supports those rhythms and the balance between your work life and your home life. So, Paula, do you think that 
Corona and the work from home, working online, has led to any substantial shift in this recognition of the balance that you're talking about right. and better understanding mm -hmm. uh, from the corporate perspective of work from home, focus on the family and integrating mm -hmm. it into professional life? I think it forced us to figure out, it forced us to realize that we can make it work. Now, look, there are uh, anomaly industries like the healthcare industry, if you're a nurse or a doctor or yeah. in the educational space, if you're a professor or a teacher, like you can't really work from home. <laughs> you need to be, you need to be in the classroom or you need to be um, in the medical space, right? Um, but what it showed is that we can get the job done anywhere and um, employees overwhelmingly, there was a Wall Street Journal article written not long ago, but overwhelmingly 95% of employees are looking for flexible hours and then 70% or more are looking for flexible location. Hmm. That doesn't really cost much from the employer, right? It's just saying we're going to give you the flexibility to get the job done when and where you can get it done. And we're going to measure the measurables. Um, it's a way to incentivize your employees. It's what they want now. And companies that don't that, and companies that don't acknowledge this, they're going to get left in the dust because people are looking for more. They're looking for rhythms that create a healthy balance between work life and home life. And what the pandemic did, of course, it forced us all to to assess, is this is this what I really want out of life? Mm. And if not, let's change it, right? So I think it really empowered the employee, but it also proved to the employer that we can get the job done and you don't have to hold us to these traditional standards, nine to five, mm -hmm. right? And there's been so many case studies and pilot programs um, in the United States and the UK around the world that are testing out this four day work week or 35 hour work week. And they're finding that productivity is actually up, mm -hmm. right? And um, employee retention is up. And um, you're not getting less out of your employee, you're actually getting more out of your employee. So take care of your employees, they're gonna take care of you. Wow, wow. As uh, the blessed leader of the fellowship who has <laughs> for a few years been uh, ranked on the 100 top best or top best nonprofits to work for in America. Um, yeah. we, def we definitely follow that policy. <laughs> we definitely follow that policy. And can I say, Yael, um, you know, I, I lay out in the book ways that that companies and society can really support families and working mothers. And one of the one of the main things we can do is by having mothers at the table. I think motherhood, it changes us scientifically. It changes you. It changed you. It changed me. Parenthood, whether we whether our babies grew in our belly or in our heart, parenthood changes us. We become and I mentioned this earlier, more empathetic. Uh, we're much more efficient. We're better leaders, better visionaries. Multitasking. Multitaskers, courageous. Like there are so many different capabilities um, that have expanded via parenthood because mm. we became a parent. We've actually become the ideal employee. And motherhood, we bring an intrinsic value and a perspective to the table. I think mothers need to be at the decision-making tables. We need to be in the boardrooms. We need to be in those C-suites like you. Mothers just have a different perspective on life. We're proven to be better visionaries and leaders. Companies uh, that are led by women are typically more profitable. Employees uh, would rather work for women-led companies, but the reality is there are very few companies that are led by women. So put mother, I guarantee if you put mothers at the helm, if you put us at the decision-making tables, where those policies are created and instituted and implemented. And if you put mothers in the boardroom, and I'm not saying at the expense of anyone else, I'm just making a case for mothers, right? I'm not making a case against anyone else, but if you put us in those decision-making seats, I guarantee you, we could change the world. Wow, wow. Paula, you are a woman of faith. A proud yes. woman of faith. Yes, I am. Who and I hear you speaking about so many <laughs> concepts that are are so biblical as far as um not for the not not against the family, not forcing women to go out and work, but of you have to be able to, if you choose in this modern world, be a working woman to also focus on your family, to also yes. hold your family, to also love and be there for your family. 
who are some of the biblical, some or one <laughs> biblical woman who you uh, learn from, who you, who you take lessons from and, and see yourself in? Yeah. So I have to admit, Yael, one of the greatest tensions that I have carried as a mother and a working mother um, has been, should I even be working outside of the home? Isn't my, mm-hmm. doesn't a good woman, doesn't a good mother stay home with her children and raise her children, which already right there, those words can weaponize, right? As if working mothers aren't raising their children too. So some of the tension that I carried um, was because of the faith circles that I grew up in and often how women were diminished um, mm-hmm. in those faith circles. And if you're not a person of faith, maybe you're in a culture or a tradition that also diminishes the roles of women. So I, I had to really, um, I had to, I, I, I really wrestled with that. Should I be working? Should I, should, you know, and I wasn't just working. I was the primary breadwinner for our, our home for a very long time. Um, and I will tell you probably the, the, the woman that has provided me the greatest amount of freedom. And I, I dedicated one full chapter of my book to this. <laughs> um, I interviewed the head of Proverbs 31 ministries, mm. the head of theology, as well as Lisa Turkhurst. She's the president of Proverbs 31 ministries. Um, because I think a lot of women carry this tension, whether it comes from their faith circles or their traditions or their culture. Um, and the greatest example that I can come up with is the Proverbs 31 woman. And we always, you know, in the Christian space, and I'm not sure about what it's like in the Jewish faith, but we idolize her and, oh, she's this wonderful mother who's up at dawn and taking care of her family and like doing it all. But what we fail to remember is that um, also the Proverbs 31 woman, she bought a field with her earnings. She was in the marketplace um, negotiating when her husband was away at war. She was handling everything. And again, she bought a field with the money that she had made. And that's a, that's a verse that has, that has provided me a lot of freedom um, I, I think that we were called back in Genesis to, to co-labor together, to co-produce together, man and woman. And there are multiple examples in the Old Testament. Yes, women, um, you know, were diminished and didn't have the same amount of rights. But but God continually and repeatedly uses used women um, to further His message, and um, He the way that God uh, would would specifically honor women at a time when it wasn't culturally popular. Um, it's really beautiful, but it's the Proverbs 31 woman who really kind of set me free. Amazing. Amazing. It's, I think it's important to normalize these concepts all around. So something Mm -hmm. that I also have tried to do through my social media, um, is to show how it's also kind of on the woman not to hide the time with her family. That's yes. often we feel like we are a good worker if all we do is work. And I do my no. fair mm-hmm. share of working. Thank God I lead offices in Jerusalem, Chicago, Toronto, and Korea. We helped over 2 million people last year in 35 oh, awesome. different countries. Um, but I make sure to always on social media, whether it's LinkedIn, a professional platform or whatever platform it is to always show those times that I have with my children, with my husband, awesome. um, because it's just as important to recognize it's not taking away from work. It's not something we hide. It's not something, but something that we're able to juggle it all and and we should be proud of it. Absolutely. And I feel like it's my highest calling. Motherhood is my highest calling. And if you make me choose, I'm always going to choose my children. But one thing I've, I've, I've learned, and I don't know if you experience any mom guilt, mom guilt is really an American thing. And I think one other bit of freedom that, um, that I found to also have these passions and pursuits outside of motherhood. Again, motherhood is is who I am and I love my children. They're always gonna be my priority. But you look in in other countries and mothers often don't have a choice but to work and they take a great amount of pride in helping to provide for the family and putting food on the table. But because um, it's just part of their culture that they don't have a choice but to work, um, there are already policies set up. They get tremendous support from society and from culture and from policy policymakers and from their family and from community because the attitude isn't your kid, your problem. The attitude is we are all part of raising the next generation. So there's this support and this structure, and they're not 
expected to carry it all. They don't try to carry it all. They have an, a beautiful interdependence on one another. They may have family members that live with them and help. And so they have this beautiful community. They're not trying to be a mom martyr. Like so often we are here in America and we're trying to put it all on our back and carry it all. And I don't want to ask for help because I'm, I'm weak or a failure. So to see that global perspective and the global mother and how she takes great pride doesn't really have a choice but to work but takes great pride but also has an incredible support and is always a mom first and the family is valued i think mm. how we honor and value families is the health of a nation flat out so, so. beautiful so yeah. beautiful paula you have been obviously uh sent for this calling you can hear <laughs> the passion in your voice and in your heart <laughs> and um i think everyone could hear a different message whatever message they need to hear from mm. all the different perspectives that you give you. um you want to show us i see you have your book behind you you want to oh, show yes. us what it looks like tell yes. us uh this where is, we could um, find it you can find it at any retailer um, that at any retailer, it's called, you don't have to carry it all ditch the mom guilt and find a better way forward. This is actually an old copy. There's a splash up here from Jenna Bush Hager. Um, and she endorsed the book. I was so excited. She said that this is the book working moms have been waiting for. Mm. So I'm really excited. We worked really hard. Um, I worked with my art director to design that book because I want that book on the cover to signify and symbolize all the things that we're trying to carry. Um, as mothers, work, motherhood, home life, all of it. And it's just that that bag is overflowing. And the message is, yes, moms are awesome. We can carry it all, but we don't need to. We don't need to do it alone. No, we don't. Mm -mm. Oh, well, thank you so much, Paula. I could talk to you for hours, but unfortunately, I, yeah, I, I <laughs> will have you back on. There's so many more I things I want, want to hear about, but I always end uh, the time with my guest by asking them to share a go-to Bible verse. And I know within so many struggles, I mm. know that you turn to, to God's word, to your faith in order to stay strong. Can you share with us a go-to Bible verse that helps yes. you get through those hard times? And it comes from the Old Testament. It is Joshua 1, 9. And it's, I think it's been my life first for probably the last 25 years, because I am a person that really struggles with fear and fear can paralyze me from pursuing what I feel God is calling me to do. And I think so often it paralyzes us. Um, but it's Joshua 1, 9. And it's, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for the Lord, your God is with you everywhere you go. And that verse um, has provided me a so much freedom and so much courage to step into my fear and for us to step into our fears because it is it that verse normalizes fear because it says don't be afraid and don't be discouraged the Lord your God is with you so it acknowledges you're gonna feel fear yeah. but I've commanded you to be strong and courageous and once you step into that fear and you follow that command to press into the fear God will be with you everywhere you go. So it's it's for it's for me giving me permission to try new things in new season, to step into my fear and to realize not only is fear normal, I should expect it, I should anticipate it um, when I'm when I'm stepping into a new space, but also I can have a piece that I am supposed to step into it. Like with Carrie Media, I had a piece to do this, to pursue this. Was I scared? I, I don't know the first thing about business and founding and entrepreneurship, but I felt this call on my heart. Paula, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged for the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. God has been with me everywhere I go. And he's going to be with me in the next season of calling and the next season of calling and the next chapter. Right now, he has called me to champion mothers in the workplace um, to, to really um, get society to value motherhood and start celebrating motherhood. And that's what I'm going to do. So beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that everyone gets a copy of your book and Thank learns you, how Yael. to integrate these lessons of uh, not needing to carry it all, finding mm -hmm. a society, a partner, a family, a community to help carry the load and it will make it better for everyone. So thank awesome. you for your life work. Thank you. Thank you for your life work too. And for being such a wonderful role model to other mothers um, and whether we're in the workforce or we choose to, to stay home. Thank you for just being such an advocate and a beacon of light for motherhood. God bless you, my friend. God, God bless, bless you. you.
Thank you for listening to the Conversations with Yael podcast. If you like what you have heard, please check out my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, that explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith with inspirational and ancient teachings. You can also visit me at mybiblicalroots.org for more of my teachings, videos, blogs, and books. Follow me on Instagram at Yael underscore Eckstein or on Facebook at Yael Eckstein. Shalom and see you next month.